Hi, I'm Michael Feldstein. Welcome back to eLiterate TV. Throughout the series, we've tried to visit a wide range of schools to show how personalized learning works in contexts ranging from large public state universities to small private elite liberal arts schools. The idea is, whatever kind of school you work at, hopefully there will be a school in the series that is similar to yours. But the next college we'll be visiting is different. Empire State College was founded in 1971 as part of the State University of New York. And it was designed to serve the needs of students who don't do well at traditional colleges through a lot of one-on-one -on -one student faculty interaction. What they achieve is hard to describe, but it's critical to understand if you want to get a sense of where personalized learning fits in to what they're trying to do. Maybe the best place to start is with how the college handles prior learning assessment. This is a trendy idea, but it's one that the college has been practicing for over 40 years in their own unique way. Um, we've been doing prior learning assessment since 1971 when the college started. Prior learning assessment is really an umbrella term um, for a range of practices, things like challenge exams or college level examination program where students might take an exam and earn college credit. There's also a couple of national organizations that look at workplace training and assess them for credit. What there's, and then there's a third method of prior learning assessment, which is a portfolio method or individualized prior learning assessment. And in this method, a student is going to document their learning, talk about what they've learned um, in their work experience, their life experience, and write an essay with supporting documentation and have it validated, uh, evaluated. Um, what makes Empire State College unique, even in the prior learning assessment field, is that many institutions that do prior learning assessment do what's called a course match. So in other words, a student would have to demonstrate, for example, if they want to claim credit for Introduction to Psychology. They would look at the learning objectives of the Introduction to Psychology course and they would match their learning to that. We are much more open-ended and as an institution we really believe that learning happens everywhere all the time. Um, and so we try to look at learning organically and we don't assume that we already know um, exactly what might be required. Uh, one of my colleagues, Alana Michelson, works on prior learning assessment. Uh, she started working in South Africa where they were, and there it's called recognition for prior learning. And she gives the example of some of the people who were involved in bringing down apartheid um, and how they sort of as an institution working with the government thought it might be ridiculous to ask those students to demonstrate problem-solving skills, right? Um, how the institution might look at problem-solving skills, and then if there was a strict match, they would say, well, wait a second, you don't have it. And yet, they're activists that brought down the government and, and changed the world. So those are some examples of why we really think we need to think, look at learning organically. Um, and so students like Melinda come to us, talk about their learning, and then we try to help them identify it, come up with a name for it, and um, determine an amount of credit um, before submitting it for evaluation. So, our project, Women of Color Prior Learning Assessment, is based on a 2010 study done by uh, Rebecca Klein Collins and Richard Olson, Fueling the Race to Success. That's found that students who do prior learning assessments are two and a half times more likely to graduate. When you start to unpack that data and you look at the graduation rates for students of color, for African American students, the graduation rate increases fourfold. For Latina students, it increases eightfold. Then when you look at it in terms of gender, a woman who gets one to six uh, credits in prior learning assessment will graduate more quickly than her male counterpart getting the same amount of credit. So that seemed very important to us and we decided, well, let's see what we could do to improve the uptake rate for um, women of color. So we designed uh, four workshops to help women of color not only um, identify their learning, value their learning, but identify what they bring with them to the institution. I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me, do you remember a particular moment early on when the light bulb went off and you said to yourself, oh, that thing that's part of my life counts? I think when I was talking to my sons about the importance of their college education and how they couldn't be successful without it, and them saying, you know, saying to me, but mom, you are successful, you run a school, you run a business, and to be 
told on days that I wasn't there, the business wasn't running properly, or to be told by parents, oh my God, we're so glad you're back because you know we couldn't get a bill or we couldn't get a statement or no one knew how to get the payroll done. That's when I knew, okay, but being told by an employee who said I wasn't needed and I wasn't relied on, I came to realize that it flipped on me and I realized that's what I had been told to keep me in my place, to keep me from aspiring to do the things that I knew that I was doing or I could do. So. The light bulb for me was when we were doing the interviews in Women of Color PLA and Francis said to me, that's your navigational capital. And then I would go to, because we would do these round tables where you would interview with one mentor and then you would go to another table. Then I went to another table and she said, well, what do you hope to do with your college degree? And I said, I hope to be, to, to pay it forward, to go continue with doing what I love to do, but to come back to other women with like circumstances and inspire them and encourage them and support them to also getting their college degrees and, and to be better, always to be better today than I was yesterday. So that's your aspirational capital. And I went, oh, okay. So I have aspirational <laughs> capital also. And then go to the next table. And, and then I was like, you know, I couldn't wait to get to the next table at that point. And I was like, okay, let me go. Because every table I went to, I walked away with like one or two prior learning assessments. And then to go home and to be able to put it into four or five page papers to submit that essay and to have it recognized as learning. You know, it, I was scared off a lot of times from coming back to school because I felt after I graduated high school and started college and decided I wanted to get married and have a family, I had missed the window to come back and get my college education. And the light bulb was, it's never too late. And that's what I tell women who ask me, and I talk to them all the time about our school and our program, like it's never too late. You can always mm -hmm. come back and, and get it done. Like it, it's goals and dreams don't have caps on them. Yeah. Even though where I was, my employer had put a cap on where I could go on, on my salary and and my position, your goals and dreams don't have a cap on it. So I think that was the light bulb for me, that it wasn't too late. Melinda's story is inspirational, but the prior learning assessment process she went through may not sound like any college experience that you're familiar with. Let's back up a little and look at the big picture of how an Empire State College education works. For starters, people at ESC don't talk about faculty or professors much. They talk about mentors. Every single person is called a mentor. Mm -hmm. It's valuable because of an assumption that is pretty much a kind of critique of a hierarchical model of teaching and learning that was the, the norm and remains the norm, um, where there is a very, very clear sense of a professor professing to a student who is kind of uh, taking in what one has to say. Mm -hmm. So part of the idea of Empire State and other institutions more and more is that there was something radically wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, a, that uh, students had something to teach us as faculty and that faculty had to learn to engage students in a more meaningful way to respond to their personal academic professional interest. So there was a real, um, you know, it was part of the time. It was a notion of a kind of equality. Um, this was really interesting to me, actually, because I came here and I was 25 years old. Every single student was older than I was. Um, so the idea of learning from somebody else was actually not very difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, at all. It was just a taken for granted. People would come with long professional lives, doing really interesting things, um, and I was a graduate student. Uh, I feel after many years that this is still very much the case, that this is a more equal situation of faculty serving as guides to students who bring in much to the learn, teaching and learning situation. A great example of how all this works in action is the story of Jesse Cologne. Jesse came to Empire State College looking for a change of careers, having been a successful professional dancer. Well, uh, I got interested in animal welfare. Um, I was a dancer out of high school. I started working right away, so I didn't go to college like most of my peers um, in my community. And after dancing for many years, I was kind of looking for an outlet. Like many, I love cats and dogs. Um, and I started volunteering at a local shelter. Uh, and from there, I started kind of living these parallel lives. And when I was ready to go back to school, it was very apparent to me that 
my second career would be in animal welfare, and I found ESC, and it was a really unique opportunity to study in the way that I wanted to study. Um, a lot of a lot of the programs that are available at colleges that are about animals have to do with veterinary or have to do with like a very uh, science-based behavioral study. Um, and I really wanted to kind of have this roundabout approach in a way that I could educate myself on working with people and animals together, and this was a unique opportunity to do so. You would think that the first step after being admitted to the college would be to take the prior learning assessments, but that's not necessarily the case. Well, um, it was not my next step. So I, because I didn't, a lot of folks come to ESC having gone to some college before. Um, I did not, I had zero credits to my name. So uh, I was linked up with my mentor, um, whose background is in animal behavior. And he suggested that even though I felt like I was very ready to commit to something, that I take a little bit of time and at least get through my first 20 credits or so. I think there's a part of this that has to do with encouraging people to follow what they love. I mean, a person might want to be a business manager, but has always thought, wow, there is something in poetry that's kind of weird, that's really inaccessible to me. Um, or, I, I was telling a colleague a few minutes ago, I'm working with a guy who's 77 years old, <clears throat> no undergraduate degree, and we talked about what he cares about. And he wants to get a degree in educational studies because that was his profession outside of the United States for many years. And I said, you know, are there other things that you care about? He brought in a portfolio of sketches that he had done. And um, I'm not an artist. I thought it was pretty neat stuff. So one of the things, while he's pursuing this very practical thing, I want to, we've also found a space in this program where the guy's going to do some artwork that would build on things that he's been doing for 40 years, but no one has ever seen. It was a little bit tricky, um, especially because I had really come here with the intention of maximizing and capitalizing on all this experience that I had. Um, but once I was looking at part of the prior learning assessment and degree planning process is looking at other schools that may have somewhat relevant programs and trying to match what your learning is to, to those. Um, so as I was looking at other programs outside of New York or at other you know, small rural schools that do these little animal programs. Um, I found that there were a lot of classes that I really wanted to take, and one of the really amazing things about Empire State is that they can also give you individualized courses. Um, and I did a lot of those. So once I saw these at, at other schools, I was like, man, I really want to take a cl class in animal-assisted therapy. And would I like to really, really in like indulge myself and do that, or should I write another essay on like, jazz dance composition. Um, I knew that, you know, one would be an, a more of a walk in the park than the other. <laughs> um, but I, I was really excited about my degree and having this really personal degree allowed me to get excited about it. So it made sense, though hard to let go of that, that prior learning in order to opt for the classes. Like I could have written you know, 20 different dance essays, but I wanted to really take a lot of classes. So I filled that with taking more classes relevant to my degree and then ended up only writing, I think, one or two dance relevant essays. The role of the mentor is critical in helping students know when they should broaden their focus and when they should narrow it. Kevin, my mentor, um, really helped me to uh, edit <laughs> what I wanted to study. Um, he helped me really keep it uh, in a, a very a significant comparison to other degree programs at other schools. Um, I could have really gone off the deep end of like, and then we're like rolling in the leaves and talking about the trees. Um, so Kevin really helped me stay focused on, on creating something that would have weight outside of just this environment. Um, he is what I would say one of the more tough mentors here. Um, and he really, uh, he just gave like a good perspective. Um, so we would sit down and talk about, you know, my grand ideas, 
we would compare them to the other programs at other schools that I had researched and then see what we could draw up that was both interesting to me and strong enough for a de degree program that would be approved. Mm. So having gone through this process of deciding which courses you wanted to take, including opting out of getting credit for courses you could have taken, um, having gone through this personalized program, worked with your mentor, and you're just about to graduate, um, compared to what you could have gotten from a more conventional program, how do you think this personalized program at Empire State has made a difference for you? Um, I think that the, the work that I've done with animals and that I'm hoping to continue to do with animals is a very niche thing. It's most people in animal welfare, it's their second career, they came out of publishing and couldn't take it anymore or whatever. Um, and because I came to have this educational experience with a little bit of that professional experience under my belt, I've been able to really focus in a way that makes sense for, for the field. Um, I think it gives me a really strong professional advantage. I don't know any of my peers in animal welfare that have had the opportunity to study this in a practical and academic setting. I think it makes a big difference in terms of I have a wider breadth of information to offer. For example, um, I've gotten to take nonprofit management and grant writing, and I think I understand when I was most of the work I've done with animals has been one-on-one -on -one with the animal or one-on-one -on -one with an adopter or one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one with a relinquisher. Um, and so it's, a very, it's been a very boots on the ground experience. And I think now I have a stronger understanding of how an organization works overall, which can only contribute to whatever perspective I decide to contribute my talents to. For over 40 years, Empire State College has been pioneering practices for supporting non-traditional students that are only now beginning to get broader attention, support, and funding. Practices like one-on-one -on -one mentoring and prior learning assessments. But they've been doing it in their own artisanal way. Now, as the college works hard to expand access to education, in our next episode, we'll see how Empire State College is trying to maintain this commitment to personalized education, while at the same time expanding access to many more students. As you might imagine, this is where they're beginning to look at personalized learning software. <laughs>